Welcome to our program today with author John Scalzi. We're coming to you live from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club in downtown San Francisco. Thank you for joining us for our program. Our guest is joining us from Ohio. We're here in San Francisco, and you are spread out, presumably, all around the world. Now, the Commonwealth Club is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public forum. We host about 500 programs a year on a wide range of topics. During this pandemic, we have switched to online only programming. We are presenting them free of charge, though, of course, we certainly welcome any donations people might want to send our way. In fact, there will be a, an on screen text to donate uh, message during the course of this program. Feel free to give if you, if you feel so desired. Um, however, don't text your questions for our guests to that number. Instead, use the chat box on our YouTube screen there uh, to send in your any questions. Someone will text those questions then to me on my phone. So if you see me on my phone, I'm not ignoring John Scalzi. Don't worry. I'm just getting the questions. And I'll try to work as many of them into our conversation today as I can. One last housekeeping note. If you have not already ordered your copy of The Last Emperor, you can order a signed copy from our local science fiction bookstore partner here in San Francisco called Borderlands. You can find the link by going to commonwealthclub.org slash online and select this John Scalzi event. Just scroll down until you find it. On the event page, we include a link to their bookseller. They will be very happy to sell you the book and ship it right to your home. Now, on to our program. Let me introduce our special guest, John Scalzi. He is the recipient of multiple Hugo Awards, and his best-selling novels have, have confirmed his status as one of the top writers in the science fiction genre today. And if that were not enough, he writes a wonderfully engaging blog at whatever.scalzi.com. His latest book, The Last Emperor, was released earlier this week by Tor Books. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club, John. Thank you. It's good to be here. How are you? I'm doing well. And in fact, before we get into your book, uh, tell us how you're dealing right now with kind of this whole weird shelter at home, social distancing, <laughs> collapse of Western civilization sort of story. Oh, I, I just I'm so excited about the collapse of as Western civilization. I've been waiting for it all this time. And finally, it's here. <laughs> Yay. Um, it's been it's been interesting. The really funny thing is that this all happened. Um, while I was on a cruise, which is kind of funny in and of itself, because people are like, you did what now? Why did you do that? Did right. You know? uh, but I was on a cruise, and then uh, March 11th hit, and in rapid uh, sequence, uh, you know, the NBA got canceled, March Madness got canceled, Tom Hanks got yeah. coronavirus, as did his wife, and my editor call, uh, sends me an email, and it's like, you have to call me immediately. Uh, and I'm like, I'm on a boat in the middle of the ocean. They have no cell phone towers. Just tell me what's going on. And that's when I found out that my book tour was canceled. Oh. And he, he said something that I thought was really interesting. He says, you have no idea what it's like here now. Um, it's been four months since Monday. And uh, it's, wow. it's kind of felt like that um, ever since. Now, as a writer, I spend a lot of time at home anyway in front of my computer. And the only people that I see are my family and my cats. So in that respect, it's been OK. But there is a difference uh, between being an introvert and not going out by choice and being an introvert and being told you can't go out. Because now I literally want to see every single person I've ever met in my life and just hang out with them, right? You know, yeah. so it's, it's, I'm dealing with it fine, but it is one of those things. It's, you know, I have, I have so many friends who was like, and when I, when, when I get out of this place, I'm just going to hug everyone. And I'm like, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. <laughs> well, very good. Um, and I, we should note that his cats actually have their own Twitter, uh, uh, account. Uh, it's scamper beasts. Is that correct? Scamper beasts. Yes. Scamper beasts. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> 16,000 followers. Oh, which is, uh, <laughs> like 120,000 followers in human ears. Um, well, let's get on to The Last Emperor. Uh, this is the third and final book in your interdependency series, which started with The Collapsing Empire, followed by The Consuming Fire. So if I can kind of give you a bit of a lead-in. So these novels tell the story of the interdependency. This is this empire of star systems. Uh, they're connected by this natural, faster-than-light transportation system called the flow. But the flow is collapsing. And the empire is set up, and I want to get into this, the empire is set up by design that each system, each, each uh, colony or whatever of humans has to rely on all the others to in order to survive. So as the flow collapses, the empire is collapsing. Uh, and the books follow a number of characters, including Cardinia, who becomes Emperor 
Grayland II in the first book, uh, as well as the physicist Mars, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, yep. Kiva Lagos, uh, the murderous uh, Natasha, and again, I'm not going to pronounce this right, uh, Noam of Eaton. No, no, you got it. Oh, great. Uh, as well as some, some others. So set the stage what, for people who maybe read the first couple of books. What's happening as this new book opens? Well, we're finally in the stage of the breakdown of this natural feature, the flow, where people no longer can deny that it's happening. Because up to this point, they're like, oh, it's not really happening. Or yes, it's happening, but it's not that bad. Or yes, it's happening, but only a few people will be affected and the rest of us will be fine. Uh, and now they're confronting that, of course, it's much bigger than that. You know, the scientists uh, turn out to be correct, as they so very often are. Uh, and uh, it's as bad as all that. And people are now going into, what do I do now? I mean, are they going to try to save as many people as possible? Are they going to try to preserve uh, wealth and only save a few people? And as we go through, I mean, our uh, heroes are definitely on the try to save as many people as possible. Uh, and our antagonists are, no, let's save the concept of the interdependency, even if that means billions have to you know, be left behind. And the thing that I thought was really important is even if you disagree with the latter view, I wanted to make sure that when people were looking at it, they could see that it's not an absolutely indefensible position. These aren't just like mustache twirling villains, um, that they actually have some underlying ethos behind it other than just grab everything and run. Although grab everything and run is part of their ethos as well. Um, so what's exciting about the third book is when you finally get to the stage where you can no longer deny the entire world is changing, it becomes a crucible for personality. It becomes a, uh, a place where we find what people are ultimately made out of. And I think that that's the really interesting thing about the third book. And how do you think Emperor Grayland II rises to that challenge? Well, she has always been a person who uh, is focused on people first. She believes the interdependency is the people, not necessarily the system or the institution. Uh, and that the uh, preferable end game is to save as many people as possible, even if the system under which they live and which has functioned reasonably well up to this particular point um, is a casualty of saving all the people. And I think that that's really uh, part of just who she is as a person, but it's also part of where she was enculturated in the society. She was not always thought, uh, thought of herself as a noble. She was not in the court of the emperor. Um, so she has a different perspective than a lot of people who you would call um, the ruling class. And I always want to be very careful about uh, doing this sort of stuff because speaking as someone who is, uh, you know, for better or for worse, a member of the 1%, you know, I don't, you know, hashtag not all 1%. But there is absolutely a case that um, um, the more uh, people uh, have access to uh, actual wealth as opposed to income, just actual wealth, the more important it, it becomes for them to save the systems and processes that have created that wealth and will uh, presumably continue to create that wealth. doesn't mean that they necessarily throw humans over the side, but their perspective is naturally going to be a little bit different. Uh, Cardinia comes from someplace where um, that is not the case. Uh, she comes from basically the middle and working class. And because of that, her perspective is going to be a little bit different than a lot of the people that she is now sort of rubbing shoulders with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I don't know if I'm the only one who, who made this connection or thought of this, but it, it, she, yes, she comes from kind of a different class, but also, you know, the fact that she was not expected to be in line for, for this role. Sure. And of course, I'm thinking back to I, Claudius and, and, you know, the, the guy they all thought was this fool who was nothing, just, you know, some crazy scholar becomes emperor. Um, how much, I mean, when you were kind of first creating this, this world, this fictional world, um, how much of her was formed at the beginning or was she the core of the book idea in your head or was the, the theme or the, uh, the setting of the flow and such? I mean, how did this all start? Well, 
I first started with the the overall concept of what would happen if you had a resource that an entire civilization relied upon. In this case, it would be the flow. And it's something that they've always relied upon, but they don't necessarily understand it and they absolutely cannot control it. And then all of a sudden it disappears, right? Um, so that was the basic setup. But from there, um, Cardinia, um, Kiva Lagos, and Mars Claremont were always the three characters that I had in mind as you know being the ones that are going to carry the story forward. And they all they each served um, kind of a different purpose. Um, in Cardinia's case, uh, she was always going to be the unexpected person thrust into a situation that she wasn't necessarily prepared for, right. but that she was not willing to abandon. You know, she knew she was in over her head, but she also knew that uh, if she didn't start swimming, um, something worse was going to happen. And it was, and I think that that is something that I think a lot of people um, have happened to them, where they look at the world or they look at events and they realize, like, I'm not supposed to be the person who's here. But on the other hand, who else is going to be able to do this and who will be uh, thinking about other people while this is all happening? It is very much the same sort of thing of, you know, in our mo in our current moment, the people who are uh, now currently, you know, working in the hospitals or who are doing things where they, they did absolutely did not expect to be thrust into danger literally every single day that they got up and they went to work. But they get up and they go to work anyway because who else is going to do it? Um, and I believe that Cardinia is of that mold. She's like, I didn't ask to be here. This is not what I wanted. Uh, but I'm here now and I have to do this because I am the person who was told that they have to do it. And here I am. So she's always been that person. Um, it's been interesting for me because I always knew what the general arc of the books were, but I didn't necessarily know how each individual character was going to sort of rise to, to the moment. Um, I don't plan my books out in like heavy detail. Uh, so in many ways, when I'm writing it, I become as surprised as the readers are, you know, about events that happen. And in this particular case, I was really happy the way that Cardinia became uh, herself, you know, come, be starting off uncertain and recognizing over her head. Uh, but as she was going on, recognizing, well, not only do I need to do this, but the simple fact of the matter is I am actually the best person for this. And maybe that's not great for the universe, but here we are anyway, and I'm going to do it. Now, there's a, a tool she has, a room as, as the emperor, that, uh, and this plays a kind of key role here, so I don't want to give anything away, but maybe sure. the setup of what that is and, and what aid she either does or does not get by, in a way, getting uh, access to the wisdom, if you will, of her predecessors. What, right. Tell, yeah, tell us about that. Well, it's called the memory room. Uh, and this was something also that I had had there uh, from the beginning. And the idea of it is, is that every impro has a sort of network uh, of uh, recording devices in their head. And it doesn't do them any particular good while they're alive. But when they pass on and the next emperor comes, all their memories, but not just their memories, their emotions and every other piece of data that they have collected during the time that they're emperor gets uh, collected uh, and can be accessed and presented in the memory room. And so what this means is uh, when Graylin becomes emperor, she can go into this room and she can talk to her father who has passed away, but who was the previous emperor, and not only talk to him, but talk to every single other emperor all the way back to Michaela, who was the very first emperor. Uh, and she can ask them any questions she wants and they will answer. Not only will they answer truthfully, but they'll answer without any ego whatsoever because they're dead you know they they, they had no they had no stakeholding anymore they're not worried about embarrassing themselves they're not worried about uh you know the judgment of history they're like well i'll tell you what i did and it, it was a terrible thing that i did but i did it and this is what happened <laughs> yes uh and i think that's a really interesting tool um because no matter what when you deal with humans you're always dealing with that level of people being people they are always going to present themselves in the way that they will put themselves in the best light, or at least the light that they think is going to be best for them over the over the course of time. And to have that sort of unvarnished access to memories and all the other ephemera 
but without the sort of pr- other person protecting their you know, uh, self-image, I think is really interesting. Now, there are other things that the memory room does that also help her out um, in terms of being out, a- able to access information elsewhere. Um, but the day-to-day memories of every single predecessor going back for a thousand years, that is a lot of uh, information. But the funny thing is, you can ask people for advice and you can get the information about how they did things. But sooner or later, humans are humans. They're still going to have to make their own mistakes. And over the course of the book, Cardinia makes her own mistakes as well. Um, if you had one of those rooms, a memory room with all of your male and female ancestors in it, uh, would you make use of it? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, that's, you know, the thing is, I know some of my ancestors, which include, for example, John Wilkes Booth, the guy who shot Lincoln, right? <laughs> so he is... I'm not sure what sort of uh, uh, wisdom John Wilkes Booth could impart. I would basically probably just pop into the memory room like once a week to yell at him, right? Like, <laughs> well, you, dude, dude, what the hell? <laughs> dude, what? Why? You do right? have this great interchange in, in the book, in the memory room, where uh, about assassination. And, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, it's not about assassinating Lincoln, but it's still kind of about, you know, the, the emperor using that or not using it as a tool. Right. Right, exactly. And the thing about it is that's really interesting is, you know, like we all have the family stories, right? Um, You know, who did what to whom and how and why and all that sort of stuff. And on one hand, it would be really interesting to be able to ask your ancestors without their ego, what were you thinking when you did this thing? On the other hand, do you really want to know, right? Do you really want to know that about your great uncle or your grandfather or your mom or dad, right? You know? Um, there's there's a penalty to knowing everything uh, that every family member pre- who preceded you ever did with their life. Uh, you can't come out of that and have the idea that, you know, your sweet old grandmother was, you know, a precious angel all the time. It'd be like, no, she did some things back in the day. And it's just as well that they were never spoken of until she was dead. <laughs> So there's another key player in in these books. That is the state religion. Uh, uh-huh. Tell us how you came up with that and what role you wanted that to play in the stories. Well, the thing about um, religion and science fiction is always really interesting because there's, for example, a school of science fiction that says, oh, in the future, there really won't be religion. Or uh, if there is a religion, then it is always an oppressive thing, Right. Um, now, I'm an agnostic. I don't think God exists, but I don't have proof. Uh, so I have to admit, as a matter of intellectual honesty, that I don't know. Um, but I don't think the existence of God is either here nor there about why we have religion and why we have spirituality. I think it's part and process about uh, how we, as primates and as animals, just access the world. There's always going to be, uh, for uh, a creature that is pattern seeking, um, that space where spirituality is going to fill a void. Um, now, that being the case, in the future, there is absolutely going to be religion. There's absolutely going to be churches. There's absolutely going to be um, some sort of orthodoxy. The way that the interdependency is designed um, was it was designed basically for a small group of people to control the way that people get around in the universe. And one way they did that was through the economics of, you know, taxing the way that people get from one place to another, accessing the flow. But the other way to do it um, is to create a uh, religious structure that is uh, useful, not particularly onerous, uh, but also serves as a good and useful uh, social backbone. And uh, it's initially... Uh, has prophecy in it, but it quickly becomes a very pragmatic and practical religion uh, until um, until uh, Cardinia decides that she needs to use prophecy again. Yeah. Uh, and that really upsets a lot of people. It's like we were we had this nice thing going with our religion where everybody was it was stayed for centuries and everybody liked it. Now you have to go introduce prophecy again. But again, she had a reason for doing it. Um, I absolutely think that a religion and spirituality. Um, are part and parcel of how we're always going to be until we fundamentally change what it means to be a human and to be a primate and to be a pattern-seeking animal. Those things are always going to be aspects of our 
uh, worldview. That being the case, it makes sense that they would need to be represented in the future. Uh, and I wanted to have a religion uh, in this universe that was not uh, overtly evil or you know completely not uh, functional at all, that it had a role, that it was working, um, and that messing with it, as Cardinia does as Greyland II, um, has repercussions, not only for her, uh, but for the uh, universe in, in, a, in a sort of general sense. So it's a fine line. You know, as someone who is agnostic, um, whenever you play with religion, um, you have to be careful that you're not just uh, dismissive. And I don't want to be dismissive of that, of an experience which is so much a part of people's lives. Uh, but at the same time, it is a plot tool, and I want to make sure I get full use out of it. So like I said, a fine line. Okay. So this book is set about, what, 1,500 years in the future-ish? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you've got, sometimes what, what, what can be really fun about a book or a movie is kind of stuff that's a, a kind of an allusion to something, but you don't really get into it. But it kind of really fleshes out the rest of what's sure. going on. And here it's kind of like, oh, whatever happened to the former connections with Earth? And what happened to the pre-interdependency empire? Um Give us a bit of background to the interdependency. And before we got to uh, uh, Ra Raquela. Raquela. Yeah, where, where she then set up this new system and including the, the church. Um, what came before this? Well, before this, um, and this is explored a lot in the second book, um, there is a larger collection of planets and systems. And it's been roughly divided into three. Um, there's basically the Earth systems, which are more or less controlled by Earth. Um, there's a al there's an, uh, second alliance, uh, which we uh, learn about. And then there are basically the free systems, which are what will eventually become the interdependency. And there is, uh, for lack of a better term, there's a schism uh, in which the free systems decide that they don't want to play with the other two uh, you know, major polities anymore, uh, and they find a physical way to break themselves off. And they were under the impression that doing that would be a clean and simple thing to do. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, they ended up uh, throwing themselves into a dark age, because when you mess with a existing political uh, system that's substantial, there is always going to be uh, repercussions. And uh, that being the case, what was kind of fun about these books is it takes place 1,500 years in the future, but it includes what is essentially a new dark age, right? Yeah. Uh, where all the information about what really happened falls down a hole, not only because things have become chaotic and, you know, record keeping has been, uh, you know, uh, disrupted, but also because everyone at the time was more or less was like, yeah, we kind of screwed that up. <laughs> Let's never speak of it again, right? Which I think is probably a greater motivator in history than a lot of people think. The uh, we messed up and we don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's just we don't speak of the bad times anymore. Um, and because of that, there's, there's there's this huge gap. And when people start moving forward again, everybody just acknowledges, well, there's this lost period of time. We don't know what happened there. But of course, the more that you examine it, just like we do in uh, European history, there were the Dark Ages, right? Um, which were basically the fall of the Roman Empire to, you know, what, the 11th century or something like that. And people are like, well, there's, things got weird then. Um, <laughs> but, and, and then for years, for years and years and years and years, it was kind of like, and then that happened. We don't speak of it. And now as we dig further into it, uh, obviously uh, a lot of what our expectations of what the Dark Ages were um, is being upended. They weren't completely you know, they weren't dark. People weren't just living in mud hovels. You know, things weren't uniformly terrible. Uh, they got bad at places. But, you know, the more we explore, the more there is there. I think it was kind of interesting as a writer to deal with a space and time where you're just saying, we don't know a lot that, that's going out there uh, for two reasons. One, uh, because it's evocative and it lets people sort of fill in that space for themselves. Uh, and the second thing is, and speaking as a writer, it's nice to just have this era where things happen and we don't you know, we don't know too much about it, which is makes it really useful when you need to pull a plot point just completely out of the air. And it's like, let's go back to the before times. Um, and uh, so for both of those things, both as a uh, 
atmospheric thing and both as a practical thing for writing. Uh, it's really super useful to have a, a dark, you know, dark ages. I recommend it highly for everyone. <laughs> Very good. We've got some questions uh, from our audience. That I want to work some in here. And one of them is something okay. we were talking about just before we went live, which is how did you decide on the pronunciation of Empero? Many of the words uh -huh. in the books have a Gallic or French origin. Sure. Thoughts on that? Um, you know, the thing is, is that I wanted to use a word uh, for emperor or empress that was new um, and that also wasn't um, uh, gender specific. Uh, and I also wanted it specifically being the only word uh, for royalty that was not uh, gender specific. And the reason for that gets revealed in the second book as well. Um, and for that, uh, empero with an X at it um, sort of fit the bill. Right. It was close enough to actually emperor that even if you just looked at it, you're like, well, it looks like emperor. So I guess that's <laughs> what it is. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it gives you a little bit of displacement. So you recognize you're in this this whole new uh, universe. Now, there is uh, a thing that because um, I pronounce it emperor and Will Wheaton, who does the audio book, pronounces it emperor because I do. And he asked me, how do you pronounce this? Um, but a lot of people would not uh, hear the audiobook version or have heard me talk about it, uh, pronounce it Emperox, right? Yeah. And the way that I the way that I get around it, I don't want anybody to think that it's wrong. Either way is wrong because you didn't have access to me talking all the time. You had no idea. Um, so the way, the way that I, I've uh, uh, sliced this baby in half, Solomon-like, um, is to say the Emperor and the court uh, pronounces it Impero. However, Imperox is recognized as a valid regional variant. So if you are if you are pronouncing it Imperox, congratulations, you're from the uh, you know the uh, the end. Uh, independence equivalent of the north, yeah. you know, or whatever. So it's not a problem, but it is uh, but it is something that uh, has popped up from time to time. Someone else writes, uh, hello, John, writing from the Basque country, excuse me, Basque country here. You have a particular Yay. approach to languages. Sometimes you use real ones like Basque and head on, and sometimes you create them. What do you base that on? Um, basically, if there is um, a cool word in an existing language that I can use that will fit the thing that I want, um, I will often use that. And then if there's not, then I will go ahead and make things up. And a lot of it also depends on what kind of book I'm writing. For example, um, the Basque word hilketa, um, which means murder, uh, is uh, used in my book Head On to describe a new sport where you literally rip the head off of an android body and run it around the field. And I wanted to use a word that actually existed in the world because those books take place about 40 years in the future. And, and I got into the mind of, uh, someone who's like a marketer. It's like, we want to use a name like headball or rip your head off or something, but what can we use? And it's like, I know, let's look through all these different languages. Here's Basque. Not a lot of people speak Basque except in Basque land, wherever that is. And so we'll <laughs> just use this word. It'll be fine. And one of the recurring things that I actually have in that uh, head on is that the people who are actual Basque speakers are like, hey, this isn't actually a good representation for us we would prefer that you not use this word, but by that time, you know, they've already used it. So, um, and to have that reflection. Now with um, The Last Emperor and the Interdependency series, and as much as it's taking 1500, place 1500 years in the future, I feel a lot freer to make up like words and names and specific places um, simply because 1500 years is a lot of time for uh, linguistic drift. Now at the same time, I, as I'm using the language that people are actually talking, I tend to default to uh, language that people today use mostly because I don't want language to get in the way, which is why, for example, Kiva used drops the F-bomb all the time, right? Um, in 1500 years from the future, that may not be the exact word that she would use, but it would be something like that. And that is, you know, the whole point of using the F-bomb right now. Um, but names will change. And uh, so I felt free to use uh, some names that haven't been invented yet and occasionally words that, you know, names that that still exist. So, um, you know, you'll have names like Nada Shea and you'll also have names like Kevin. So you get them all. Kiva must have been a fun character to, to write because she is a, a breath of fresh air every time she comes through and just kind of 
<laughs> no holds barred in what she says. Um, right. What, was she as fun to write as she seems? She was a ball to write, and she. But you. But I also had to be really careful because um, I, I have a T-shirt uh, that says, "I am here to is usurp your narrative," and what that means is here is a supporting character that is so much fun to write that eventually they become the core of the story. Um, and that can be fun, but that can also uh, be a problem with your story because they're not meant to be on stage all the time. It's the uh, Merry Wives of Windsor problem, right? Where, um, you know, Falstaff was such a popular character because when he came in, he was so much fun and he was so interesting uh, that eventually they're like, let's give him his own play. And that play was kind of, eh, you know, <laughs> if you've ever seen Merry Wives of Windsor, it's like, eh, I mean, it's it's clearly Shakespeare slumming. It's Shakespeare going, well, the Queen said she wanted this character to have his own play, so I guess I got it, right? Um, and so you have to be really careful about the super fun characters to write, uh, both that they don't end up hogging all the spotlight, and also that you don't end up making them caricatures of themselves. And this was actually really important for Kiva because he, the way Kiva uses language and the fact that she drops so many F-bombs and she is profane and she is with completely without filter means that um, she can become a, a sort of monstrous uh, character of, you know, a strong woman or something like that. And I didn't want that. I wanted her be a character that was recognizably human and, and was not just plot service and fan service. So she was she was fun to write, but she was a, she was a tricky person to write. I needed to treat her with respect in order to uh, to get her right. And of course, there are still people who's like, she says too many F-bombs. And I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> she's going to do what she's going to do in that particular regard. But it is one of those things that that I thought was really interesting. Um, after the second book, people were coming up to me. I love Kiva. You have to promise me that nothing bad will happen to her. And I'm like, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I mean, you know, quite frankly, uh, bad things might happen to her. And this is, you know, the thing, if you'll have to read the third book to find out what happens to her or doesn't happen to her, I'm not going to say. But I will say, um, if you want a uh, author to treat a character poorly, tell them that they can't, right? <laughs> well, They will absolutely find ways to, to put your favorite character through a ringer. It wasn't just to her. You know, there were other characters that are like, don't do anything mean to, to this character. I like them. I'm like, mm -hmm. now you've done it. You shouldn't have told me that. This will be your fault when it happens. Well, it's funny because we have two different questions about Kiva and can she have sure. her own spinoff series? She was so great to, to read. Um, and it's funny, you, you went back to Falstaff. It's kind of an example of a, a lower character kind of takes over thing. I, right. of course, was just thinking, you know, Michael Keaton from Family Ties. Uh, right. But uh, what about Urkel. the issue? Sorry? Urkel, yes. Or Urkel. Um, but do you have any thoughts uh, or any plans for, I mean, without going, I don't even want to hint at how this book ends, but sure. one could see something happening in another book. Do you have any uh, inklings of a spinoff? No. Um, and my my current line for this is the trilogy is meant to be the trilogy. Um, the whole arc is there. Um, the universe goes on uh, in the book's beyond the arc of the story because the universe just goes on, you know? Uh, so there is obviously um, going to be places where people can see, I can see where you left yourself space to write more in the universe. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is right now, as we speak, I have no plans to go uh, write anything additional in that universe because the trilogy is done. Uh, and also because uh, from a purely practical matter, I don't know what else to write in the universe, and I have nine other books on a contract that I have to write first. So um, that being the case, uh, it'll be a while before I get back to the universe. I never, in the case of any universe, say, no, I will never go back to it because um, I don't think anybody can make those sorts of promises. We all know the author is like, I'm done with this universe, and I never go back. And then all of a sudden, they have a mortgage payment, and they're like, <laughs> we're coming back a triumphant return to this universe. You know? and which is totally fair. You know, it's like I write for money. I get it, you know, um, but I don't want to set people up for, you know, 
you will, I will never come back to them. I'll come, come back to the universe. I may one day come back to the universe. It is very doubtful if I come back to this universe, it will be with the same characters in the same time frame, uh, with the same circumstances. So, um, at this point, if you want more of this universe as it currently exists, um, this is a really tremendous time for you to start writing fanfic because that's what that's how you're going to get it. Um, and again, I never say never. If all of a sudden the Interdependency series sells 20 million copies and Tor backs up the money truck and says, <laughs> give us one more with Kiva, um, you know... Uh, I could use a new boat. So sure, why not? Um, but at the moment, there are no plans to uh, to do that. So. Okay. You mentioned earlier uh, Will Wheaton's uh, audiobook version of this. Uh, and someone sure. asks, what do you think about Will Wheaton's audiobooks? He's terrible. I hate everything about him. He's just yeah. the worst. Get no, rid of him. no, 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 no. Will's a friend of mine. Um, and um, Audible bought uh, many years ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, Audible bought a, bought a bunch of my backlist. And uh, they said, do you have any ideas for who you can see um, doing the um, doing the uh, audio for this? And I said, uh, think about Will Wheaton. Uh, and it wasn't just because Will was a friend of mine. It was because Will and I are within a few years of each other's age. We grew up in the same area. And if you ever listen to the two of us speak at the same time, we have the same vocal patterns. He's better at speaking because he is a professional actor, but the the cadence uh, and uh, you know and the way that he uh, brings my stories to life is very much how I would do it if I was a really good voice actor like he is. So he is as close to me as you're going to get, but better um, for audio. And as it turns out, you know, so that was that's when he did uh, Agents of the Stars, Androids Dream, um, and Fuzzy Nation. Uh, and he was terrific on those. And so he's been doing them uh, ever since. He's done the Interdependency series. He did uh, Lock In in tandem with Amber Benson, who also did a tremendous job of it. Um, and uh, I've always been delighted with uh, the way that he works. It's also really good because he and I have a very good working relationship because we are friends. He can call me up and say, how do I pronounce this? Or the other thing that he often does is while he's reading it, um, he'll be like, just read chapter six, you know, how dare you, you know, all, so I'm getting commentary <laughs> yeah. while he is, uh, while he is reading it. Uh, and that's always fun, uh, as well, because he is a friend and because I know that he enjoys the books as well as just narrates them for a job. So I'm a big fan of Will, and I certainly hope that he and I can collaborate on audiobooks for a long time to come. Someone asks, uh, what tends to come first? Do you create a world and then set a story in it or write a story and flesh out the world as part of the story? We kind of touched on yes. that a little bit before, but maybe some more on that. Yes. And the answer is yes. I mean, it really depends. Sometimes it is characters first and sometimes it is uh, world building first. The thing that I always tell people is there's not really any, I mean, at least for me, there's not any one process that works every single time. Um, Neil Gaiman once quoted Gene Wolfe as saying, all that writing a novel teaches you is how to write that particular novel. When you get to the next novel, all the rules go out the window. Um, and that being the case, you know, sometimes I will come up with the character first and then build from there because I really want to have a character like this. Sometimes I will build the universe first and then run the characters through an adventure, you know, through that particular world. Um, it really depends on the project, and it really depends on lots of other things. For the interdependency, since I knew it was going to be a series of books, it wasn't just going to be one book, I built the world out a little bit more than I might uh, for otherwise in other other books because I knew that I had to be in that universe for a long time. And then I put the characters in that I thought would be interesting to have deal with this particular situation. But with short stories or with novellas or uh, even some of the uh, original novels that I did, um, they were characters first and then um, build the world more around them. So it's never one thing or the other. And I think as writers, you have to be open to the idea that not only does not one process fit every writer, but one process does not fit every project. There are some times where you are just going to uh, have to tear up the rule book that has worked so well for you before and try something new. I have 
changed my swing in terms of writing at least two or three times since I started writing novels back in 2001. Um, now, am I correct? The the uh, Collapsing Empire has been optioned for TV? Yes, it has been optioned for television. What can you tell us about that? Absolutely nothing, um, except that it has been optioned for, for okay. television. I can say without mentioning any specifics because it's not my place to make announcements um, or to say who's engaged and how and why. All I can say is um, that I have met with people who I'm working with on this and uniformly uh, with this project, I am super happy with the people who are um, engaged with it. Um, we've got some really excellent people um, they have come in with, I think, are the not only the right ideas for approaching the stuff that I've done, but also the right ideas in terms of expanding and adapting, because the series will not be the books. It's got to be something else completely different. Um, it's going to take the events of the books, um, and it's going to take the characters of the books, and in some places it's going to have to expand, in other places it's going to have to contract. Stuff is going to have to be added. Some stuff may have to be dropped out. Um, and that's just part and process of going from one medium, which is novels and books, into another, which is television. And what I can say is, at this point, everybody who's working on it has the right idea of this. It's like, treat the stuff that exists well, accept the fact that there's going to be new stuff, make the new stuff super cool as well. So, again, without getting further into it, hopefully soon we will be able to make some announcements. Um, but in the meantime, just know that I'm really happy with how things are going. And can you tell us, are you going to be involved in it or are you, you were just meeting the people? I am I am an executive producer on the series, um, which can mean many different things. Sometimes it means you are engaged on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it is, here's an extra pile of money, now go away. Sure. Um, and so... Uh, and my involvement is somewhere between the two of those at this particular moment. Uh, the way that I see my role there as an executive producer on this particular project is a resource and as the, um, you know, the person that uh, the other people who are building it can come to to help problem solve. I have enough confidence in the people that are working on it, that I am ready to let them do a lot of the heavy lifting and they don't need me to micromanage, but I'm absolutely available to them um, anytime that they have questions. And of course, they'll have to send me, you know, everything as it goes along and I will be giving them notes and stuff like that. But like I said, uniformly, great people. Um, and, you know, hopefully it gets made. There's lots of places that it can fall down between me talking about it now and it getting a green light and it moving forward. So um, don't believe in it until it actually shows up on your screen. Um, but right now, everything seems to be going pretty well. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that then. Um, so at, someone asks, of course, the usually would be the last question, but I'm going to work it in here. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us anything about what your next book is? Um, the next project that's coming out and will probably be the second half of the year. We haven't uh, worked out the specific timing of it yet. Um, is, um, another book in a, another series that I'm, that I'm doing, uh, which is called the dispatcher series. And then the dispatcher series is the world's pretty much the way that it is right now, except that when you intentionally try to kill somebody by murder or, you know, a rocket into their house or something like that, uh, they don't. Uh, they don't necessarily die. 999 times out of a thousand, they come back. And so it becomes really difficult to murder people. So that's the sort of world that these stories take place in. The first um, story of that was originally an audiobook exclusive through Audible um, and then was put out in print uh, a few months later by Subterranean Press. Uh, the, ne the next one will also follow that pattern. It's going to be an audio uh, exclusive on Audible first. And then we'll become a print uh, book a little bit, uh, a few months down the line from there. But it's done. It's in. Uh, if I get eaten by a bear, it will still come out. Um, so that's already done. And then after that, uh, we, I know that I'm writing a novel that's supposed to come out next year. Um, which one I'm still having discussions with in terms of uh, talking to my editor. Because I don't know if you know this, but apparently there's a 
a global pandemic coming or is is here uh and must just be in ohio yeah i know it might be a regional thing but um but uh and things have changed completely and part of that is um i have a I have a long standing contract with Tor. Uh, it was originally 13 books. It's now down to nine because I put four out. Um, but part of that is, is looking at the books that I have proposed to them and thinking, what is the next book that we think people are going to want to pick up? You know, if we are still uh, a year from now in a recession, is somebody, are they going to want a dark and gritty book or are they going to want something that's a little lighthearted? What are they going to want? Um, I had spent, I'm going to be spending the next month uh, promoting this book, doing what I'm doing right now. Hi, everybody. Um, and then after that, that's when we really sit down and decide which thing we're going to do next. We had something that we thought we were going to do. We need to double check if that's the thing that we want to continue doing or if we want to change things up. The point is, there's going to be a book next uh, year in 2021, probably in 2022, probably in 2023, and so on and so on uh, for at least another decade. Um, it's nice to actually have that sort of job security as a writer, especially now, right? Well, yes. Well, it's funny. It was reminding me of Pat Benatar, the rock singer back in the early 80s. She had this contract with Chrysalis Records that she had to come up with right. a record every year. And at one of her interviews, she was saying, you know, I imagine myself at the age of 60, you know, just having to still go out there in spandex and create these things. You, you actually include in, in the uh, acknowledgments of this, uh, the last emperor that you have for several books procrastinated and gotten it in at the last minute. Is yep. the writing process for you different? Is it is it more enjoyable, less enjoyable? Does the stress bother you? Do you do you think you come up with better stuff when you have that pressure? Well, the thing about it is, and there's 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 a context to this. Okay, so the first job that I had as a professional writer, where I was writing full time, um, was actually at the Fresno Bee in Fresno, California. I was a full time film critic, um, but I was also an opinion column. And once a week, I would write, you know, I, the way I explain it is at age 24, I became a professional mansplainer, which is not a great thing when you're a 24 year old. Uh, <laughs> and I've been I've been dealing with the after effects of that for the for the rest of my life. But the whole point of it is, is that I my job was looking at the news and thinking about things to, to say about it. Um, and so that is how I got that's how, to, how I cut my teeth as a writer, you know, having opinions on current events, you know in entertainment, but also in the world in general. So it's very difficult for me to shut off the rest of the world. Um, I started writing this series in 2016, right around the time that the, um, you know, the election cycle really started spinning up. And, um, and it was very difficult for me to pull my attention away from that. And as a result, a quarter of the collapsing empire got written in the space of a week uh, when I was in... Um, when I was in Hawaii, because it's six hours behind everything else that's going on in the United States, you'd wake up and the day had already happened and there was nothing you could do about it. So you might as well write. Um, so that was great. I told my wife at the time, I was like, I think we need to go to Hawaii every time I have a book due. And she's like, I really like this idea. Let's do that. <laughs> um, and, but, but that's been the problem is, is that, you know, I find it so hard to pull away that I eventually get myself jammed up. The second book in the series, The Consuming Fire, I actually wrote in two weeks wow. because I got so, I had another book that came out and I had to do a promotion cycle for that and all the other stuff in the world happened. And all of a sudden it was June 4th, the book was due June 18th. And I was like, I've written 6,000 words. And I turned to Chrissy, my wife, and I was like, so what's going to happen is... I'm going to close the door to my office. You're going to slide food underneath the door two times a day. There's going to be a jug by the side of the door. You will empty that <laughs> once a day. And this is how it will be. And she was like, the jug thing's not going to happen, but the rest of it fine. And then I wrote it basically in two weeks. I didn't tell anybody that until the book came out and it did fine and, and all that sort of got good reviews and it hit the, the bestseller list. And I was like, okay, by the way, I did this. I was determined not to do it this time. But I still ended up being at the last minute with about uh, 50,000 of the words. Wow. Um, what I'm doing now is that I'm just, when I need to write, I have this thing that's called the Freedom App. It blocks off Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and news sites so that all I can do is work on the book from 8 o'clock in the morning till uh, 12 noon. Uh, and I hate. I really hate that I'm the person who needs this app in order to actually get work done. But 
uh, more than I hate being that person, I hate being the person who doesn't get their work done. Um, and it's just a simple fact that this is what I need to do. So that is how I'm doing it. I would like for the rest of my books to uh, actually be much more congenial to, to write. But for that to happen, I kind of need the world not to be on fire all the time. I mean, it's not just about me. Let's be clear. Like you ask any writer um, and pretty much they're like, I don't know how anybody gets anything done. Same with the editor, same with publisher, same with basically everybody. It's like, how is it? How, People flip burgers these days really amazes me. By the way, people who flip burgers, thank you for your service. I do, in fact, like the fact that I can still get a burger. Um, they deserve $15 an hour, but um, at least. But, you know, the thing about it is that we all have to continue doing what we're doing. So for me, it's the Freedom app and getting used to the idea that for four hours a day, all I'm doing is writing, and that will help a lot. Okay. Someone asks, are you going to be involved in the second season of Love, Death, and robots. I cannot speak uh, about that right now because uh, it's not my place to say. Um, but I can say that I am super excited for what the second season of Love, Death, and Robots has in store for you. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> okay. Um, Someone actually brings up the, the, the emotion and humor in your books. And that was a question I was going to write because obviously it's one of the most enjoyable things about reading your books is, is your humor. Obviously from talking to you, I, I, you, you have a great sense of humor. Do you, do you, how do you work that into a book? I mean, is that just natural or do you go back in later and think, okay, I need to punch this up with something? I need to funny it up. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, I think the humor is inherent in who I am as a person. Um, and, uh, I think that it's, I think every writer gets certain things, uh, if not for free, at least with a, uh, lower amount of effort than other things. And, um, one of the things that I get for free, um, is humor. And there's probably a long, you know, uh, psychological personal reason for all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, we don't have time for that. Um, but the, the upshot of it is, is that. I'm pretty good with humor. It's always been part of my personality. So it makes sense that when I started writing books, that humor would be um, part of it. Now, one of the things about humor or dialogue, which is another thing that I get for free, um, so to speak, um, is that when you're really good at something, um, that's great, but it can also become a crutch. Um, and so I have to be really careful because humor is great to leave in a moment, but it also is a great way to avoid um, actually doing the emotional work that you have to do in order to make a scene resonant or to um, put depth into a character. And so much of humor is deflection, emotional deflection. Um, and you have to be careful as a writer, or at least I have to be careful as a writer, uh, not to use humor as a way of avoiding um, where my characters need to go or where a scene needs to go. Uh, same with dialogue. It's so easy for me to have that back and forth banter um, that I have to be very careful that uh, I just don't make everything uh, basically read like two people having a conversation in an empty room in space where, you know, there's no other, there's no indication of anything else that's, that's going on. Um, so for me, I think humor is endemic uh, to who I am and what I do. I couldn't avoid it if I tried. Although I have written something uh, that is completely devoid of humor, which I absolutely love, which is called The God Engines. It is absolutely unrepresentative of anything else that I've ever written, and I highly recommend it for people. Um, but generally speaking, um, it, I get it for free. I can't, I can't imagine uh, for most of my novels trying to avoid putting it there. And also, I just think that everybody... Uh, has humor. Even in the darkest moments, there's always going to be uh, humor, whether it's, you know, you're in war or you are in a dystopian environment or, you know, whatever happens, someone's going to make a, someone's going to make a joke because that's what humans do. And uh, I'm not going to avoid making a joke when somebody would make a joke. And it makes sense for someone to do that. Well, one of the best ways people can uh, access you and your humor between your books is, of course, your blog, whatever. Sure. Um, and one of the things I really liked about it when I f first discovered it, and I'm, it's still going on, of course, is you not only shine the spotlight on your work and your thoughts, but you share it with other authors and let them explain their new book and the ideas behind sure. it. How did that come about? Well, um, 
the big idea, which is the thing that you're talking about, where it was basically they come onto the site and they talk for a whole post about what the big idea behind their new book is. Um, it happened because um, two things happened. One, because the website uh, back in the day when blogs were still a big thing, um, blew up and it became one of the most visited personal sites on the internet. Um, and so it was a place where uh, I had the ability to promote other people, right? Um, and to let them talk about their books. Um, and the second thing is I was the recipient as a writer of the kindness of other writers who promoted uh, the things that I was doing and who talked about my writing and who gave me, um, you know, a boost when they had absolutely no um, personal benefit of it uh, other than the recognition that um, it's a community rather than everybody, you know, for themselves. The world of, of writing is not zero sum game. Um, if another writer does very well, it doesn't mean that you are doing poorly. In fact, um, because writers typically can only do a book or two at most a year, the people who love reading are going to look for other people as well. Um, so that being the case, it makes sense for writers to promote other writers and creatives to pro promote other creatives. Um, so for me, I got that boost from other people. I benefited from them. I got lucky um, that I became a, in my uh, in my small pond, I became a medium to large sized fish. Um, and so when it came time to uh, promote other writers, I said, what's the best way to do this? And for, you know, the blog was an easy way to do it. I can't read every single book that somebody wants me to read, right? I don't have time because I have to read, uh, you know, uh, I have to write my own stuff. And then you just, I guess there's so many books that are coming out. But what I can do is say, I have this space. We get thousands of readers who come by a day. Um, talk about your book. Tell them what's exciting about your book because you are your best salesman. Um, and being able to do that has been great. Not only because that means that I learn about new books, you know, which is great because I even I can't keep hold of track of everything that's going on, but um, that you know my audience is an audience of readers. They are going to want to know. They are going to want to be interested. And the Stuff that uh, people are reading now, the the readers, the writers who show up there are people who, when they become big, because so many of the writers who, uh, you know, wrote about their debut on The Big Idea have gone on to become bestsellers, have gone on to win Hugos and Nebulas and other awards and stuff like that. They will also remember that when they were starting out, I and other writers help them. And we perpetuate that cycle of it's not a zero sum game, that we all benefit when we realize that we are a community rather than just working, you know, one person in one room. Um, so I do it. I do it for me as a reader. I do it for them as writers and I do it for us as a community. And I'm just glad I'm able to do it. Um, another thing you get into on your blog from time to time, of course, is politics. And, uh, and I forget if this was... What? Never, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I forget if the, what I'm going to refer to was during the 2016 campaign or if it was after the election, but you were writing about, you know, this increasing polarization and the, the self-sifting that the country has gone through, how you are a liberal living in, is it rural or small town, Ohio, pretty much yeah. everyone around you is Republican, one degree or yeah. another. Um, Republican and, or conservative. Yeah. But, but you were saying to largely liberal readers saying, hey, folks, these are not evil people. They're wonderful sure. people. I get along with them. They're nice. They, they, they don't burn my house down. Tell us and, and tell people who have very homogenous friendship circles, what do you yeah. get out of the fact that you, you do live in a different era? Well, I mean, the thing about it is that um, – where I live, uh, like I said, you know, I live in a place that's called Dark County, uh, Ohio, and it is, um, it went 78% for Trump in 2016. Wow. And every, right? And uh, everybody, uh, most everybody here is conservative to some degree or another. Um, the people who have lived here have lived here for 150 years. If you go down to the, um, to the local cemetery, which is Harris Creek Cemetery, which is the cemetery that I note in uh, at the beginning of Old Man's War, there are gravestones 
with that are uh, you know more than 100 years old that have the same names as the last names as the kids that my daughter went to school with. Right? Wow. These are people who are very much tied to the land, have always been here, have always been uh, part of this community. I've lived here for 20 years, and we're still new people. Um, and it, but the thing is, is that 80% of experience of life um, is exactly the same for each of us, right? Uh, my neighbors are Republicans, um, but not only are they Republicans, they're also blue collar folks, you know, whereas I'm a white collar, I write science fiction, okay? You know, uh, I have a college education, most of the people around me do not. Um, there are so many cleavages uh, in terms of what our Venn diagram is, um, and yet on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm kind to them. They are kind to me. I, you know, I will watch their cats. They will watch mine. If somebody uh, comes to the house and they don't recognize the car, they will text us and say, did you know such and such that this car is there? Is this a thing we need to be concerned about? Yeah. Um, the community feeling is, is there. Now, one of the things that's really important about this is in recognizing that, uh, that individuals are good people or kind people does not necessarily mean that you subscribe to the world the worldview of, for example, electing Trump. One of the things that I wrote uh, once the uh, the election had happened uh, it was what I called the Cinemax theory of racism, which is uh, uh, people who voted for Trump did not necessarily vote uh, for him. Uh, and racist policies or whatever. But they knew that those racist policies were there. They could have done it for economic reasons or they could have done it for other reasons. But the simple fact of the matter is they knew that the racism, the sexism, the, you know, uh, you know America firstism, all that sort of stuff was part and parcel of the thing. And so they could not act surprised uh, when all of a sudden people are like, you voted for a racist. Well, I'm not racist. So going, you might not be racist. You might be a wonderful person, just as my neighbors might be a wonderful person. But in fact, these are the things that you voted for. They weren't hidden. He talked about them at length. You knew they were there and you decided to vote for them anyway. This is, and it's like, like I said, with the Cinemax theory of racism, if you want HBO on your cable uh, and they only bundle it with Cinemax, you know, um, and you get that package, are you a Cinemax subscriber? And the answer is yes, because you're like, but I don't watch Cinemax, but you still subscribe to it. It's right. like, you're not a racist. And I absolutely believe that the vast majority of my neighbors aren't racist, but they voted for a racist. You know, they voted for racist policy. So you can absolutely call people on that, just as uh, people, you know, when Obama was president and I, uh, and they had policies, and Obama had policies that they disagreed with, um, they could call me on those and I would be there. Well, I agree with those and that's just the way it is. Or no, that's not something I agree with, but I understand that was part of the package. You can still have those conversations. You can still call people out. You can still, you know, have that thing where you recognize that, um, people, uh, make, uh, choices that you don't agree with that hurt people and that are wrong, but, that you can also talk to them and explain why it is that you feel that the way that you feel, and they can have those same conversations with you. I am absolutely not going to be voting for Trump in the 2020 election. I don't think that's a surprise for anyone here. I also know that the vast majority of my neighbors are also going to vote for Trump. And I, you know, if we're going to have political conversations, I'll be like, come on, you can't pretend that you don't know what this is and how this reflects on what you're doing. Um, and these are conversations that happen all over the place. I have friends who are liberals who are still um, have problems with, uh, with um, trans people, whether or not they're really um, you know, male or female or, some, or, or things like that. And that's a real cleavage. I believe that you know, I have my very specific opinion on that and to know that I have uh, people that I know, like, love, and care about who are like, I don't believe this woman is actually a woman, or I don't believe this man is actually a man. Um, that's a real issue. And I have to, and I have to confront them when that gets brought up as an example, but it doesn't mean that I can't recognize that these people are important to me, that I do care about them, that I do love them. And perhaps being the person that represents, um, that division to them and being able to explain to it 
uh, explain it to them in a way that they don't feel like they're immediately attacked uh, might help uh, them change their mind or at least uh, change the way that they approach a particular problem. Maybe I'm naive and maybe I, you know, and maybe I am benefiting so much of being a straight white man who doesn't have to fight these battles every single day. But at the same time, that's kind of where I am. Well, very good. I'm afraid we've come to the time where we are uh, out of time. All right. Um, a big thanks to author John Scalzi, author of The Last Emperor, Old Man's War series, and many more. And thanks to all of you for watching this program or listening to our podcast. You can see all of our upcoming free online programs at commonwealthclub.org slash online. You can go to that same URL, find this event, and also find out how to get a signed copy of The Last Emperor. So thank you all. Thank you, John, and have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye-bye.